it dawned on me after creating this video that it may appear as though I'm recommending fall breeding for garter snakes, and that is not the case. I still believe that spring is the best time to breed after a good brumation cycle. I believe that many of these points will be relevant whether you're breeding in the spring or the fall in terms of what to look for. So hopefully this helps. Hey, good morning everybody. Brett Dunn with Garters Done Right. So uh, it's fall and I'm getting a lot of questions about breeding because this time of year in garter snakes, there's a lot of breeding going on. And uh, I wanna talk a little bit about that and then what happens after that, what you should look for, some ideas of what you could be doing or should be doing. Um, as always, the disclaimer is always the same. I'm not an expert. I'm not professing to be an expert. What I'm sharing with you is two things as always, what I've seen and experienced myself and what this huge community of uh, friends that I have have shared with me. Uh, collectively, I don't know, I've never really calculated it, but I would guess that the group of people that I'm leaning on for my information probably have a collective 100 years of garter breeding experience. I'm not exaggerating. In the future, we'll be doing some videos with them, so you'll get to know them better as well. So again, it's fall, right? And so uh, online, we're seeing a lot of people post pictures and videos of their snakes going through courting behavior, and in some cases, actually breeding. Okay, so I want to talk about the differences there a little bit so you know what you're seeing. When you see your snakes um, slithering on top of each other and shaking and quivering and all that, uh, that's typically what's considered courting, right? So the male is courting the female, riding her, you know, on her back, and all of those um, kind of vibrations and waves that he's sending through his body are to trigger her to accept him so they can breed. Okay, that's what you're seeing. Now, typically what you're looking for to confirm what's called a lock is they literally lock together, okay? In fact, some breeders, um, when they're breeding garter snakes uh, on purpose, right, and planning for it, they'll put the uh, pair into a tub or into an enclosure that has uh, paper towels or vermiculite, for example, something that's very light in color because oftentimes what happens is there's a little bit of bleeding involved in the, um, in the breeding process. And so if you're not there to witness the entire event, you can look for blood and that will often be the telltale sign that you've had six, well, you've had, a, you've had breeding, doesn't mean it will be successful. All right, so here what you're seeing is an actual lock. They're going from the courting directly to locking. Now they're locked, she's starting to drag him away. In this next clip here, you're, you're looking at the actual lock for the female plains garter that we're talking about today. You can, again, literally see they are connected. Uh, they can't separate until they're done at this point. So you'll, you'll, you're looking for this. You might also see the female actually drag the male around like this. It's pretty common as well, but it's definitely a lock. Now remember, with any kind of breeding of any animal, just because you have a confirmed lock does not mean that you will have a gravid or pregnant garter snake, okay? Uh, remember, the, the female has to ovulate. There's a couple things to look for, right? So early on, uh, after you've witnessed a lock or have evidence of a lock or believe there was a lock, then you're looking for um, signs that she ha has ovulated uh, in the, you know, leading up to that or will ovulate shortly thereafter. The female will retain the sperm um, for long periods of time, typically. So if she doesn't ovulate shortly thereafter, or if she's not ovulating when the breeding happens, she could ovulate later and retain the sperm and then have a successful uh, season, so to speak, okay? So what you're looking for are signs. When, when the female ovulates, she'll gain weight, okay? Now this is where it can get a little confusing and it's easy to misinterpret what you're seeing. So she'll gain weight from the eggs inside of her um, starting to grow, okay? And you're looking for that first. So if it's a fall breeding and whether that's on purpose or not, maybe you just cohab your animals or, uh, or maybe it's planned, either way, uh, you're looking for the female to gain some weight. Uh, another good sign, of course, is if her feeding response increases significantly. You want to watch for that within uh, like the first 30 days after 
the, uh, the successful lock, you're looking for the weight gain and you're looking for uh, an increased feeding response. Those two things are an indication that you may have a successful uh, mating, okay? So now what happens if the female ovulates and there is not a successful breeding? What happens then? Well, maybe you've heard people use terms like jellies, jelly beans, uh, wax eggs, things like that. Okay. Now that can be dangerous to the female. What can happen is uh, the female has unfertilized eggs inside of her. Those eggs grow to a certain extent, but, but they don't, because they're not fertilized, they don't turn into baby snakes, right? Those must pass. So sometimes what you'll see in your enclosure are these little orange or yellowish colored jelly bean size egg sacs basically okay and they'll they'll come out and they'll be moist and and uh, squishy right but then they'll quickly dry out and get crusty and and you know just be in the bottom of the enclosure if you don't see them right away so that can be dangerous because if the female doesn't pass those they can turn septic and you know basically rot inside of her and she could pass from it can also have an uh, basically an egg binding kind of situation where they can just get stuck female tries to pass them, can't pass them, same thing happens. So, um, so be warned that I've heard from many breeders um, that they've lost females due to an ovulation cycle that was not fertilized, okay? So be aware of that. Um, if that happens, you know, you just gotta have to let it kind of play out and hope for the best. So let's go back to the good news, right? So whether you have a successful uh, pairing in the fall or not. Um, the tricky part is if you see them breed in the fall, you have to make a decision, right, as to whether to brewmate or not. Now this is the part where if you ask 10 people, you're going to get 10 different answers, okay, or opinions. Guys, I'm going to say it one more time. This is my opinion based on what I've seen and what I've heard from the folks that I talk to the most, okay, and there's a lot of them. You've got to make a decision, right? So you want to, let's say that you had Let's use this one as an example. I, I confirmed a lock on August 21st. I visually saw a lock August 21st, okay? Well, I wouldn't normally be brewmating that early anyway, so there wasn't any real risk, okay? But by September, what I was looking for, and we're gonna look at this girl here in a minute, what I was looking for is, is she putting on weight? The answer was yes, she was putting on weight. There were three females in this enclosure before. So I, I watched all of them, of course, but I watched the one that I knew had, had locked with a male really closely. She started gaining weight. Her appetite became stronger. So what did I do? I brumated the other two, okay? And I left her in here. And I'm glad that I did because it's very clear when you see her in a minute, she's definitely gravid. Okay, so, so that's what you wanna do. If you see, see them lock, watch them for 30 days or so. If uh, basically, if the eggs are inside and are not fertilized in that 30, maybe 45 day window, they just won't be viable anymore. That's what I've been told. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about what if everything goes well, right? Like this one that we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay, so uh, the gestation period for garters uh, varies a little bit from species to species. It has a little bit to do with husbandry, actually a lot to do with husbandry with, with respect to temperatures and that sort of thing. But typically between 60 and 90 days, somewhere in that range. Now, today is October 23rd, okay? So she's at a little over 60 days right now, and you're gonna see how big she is. Now, she could drop babies anytime soon, so we're gonna talk about what to look for um, once you have a, a snake that you're pretty confident is actually gravid. You're pretty confident she's gravid, and you're trying to monitor where she's at in the cycle. Maybe you know the date that she became pregnant. Maybe you don't, okay? You're trying to gauge all that, right? Because again, there's there's a 30-day window or so that she could drop today. She might go another 30 days before she drops in the case of this girl here. So what do we do? There's a few things that I do, okay? So one of the things I do, remember she's by herself at this point, step one, okay? Um, step two, I like to remove anything from the enclosure that little teeny tiny babies could get hidden in. What I don't want to do is for her to drop babies 
and then me have to turn things inside out to find them all. Believe me, that's happened to me, okay? So I'm gonna remove anything from that enclosure where little babies could hide. As an example, this piece, uh, this decoration was in that enclosure, okay? They love to climb on it, it's great. I also filled it with expanding foam so that not only babies can't get inside, but adults, you know, small adults can't. But man, I'm just telling you, all of the nooks and crannies and something like this, even up underneath these leaves and so forth, these little tiny babies can hide in all of these nooks and crannies. Just get rid, just get it out of the enclosure for now. Now you don't want to take everything out of there to the point that the uh, adult is uncomfortable, right? You still want them to be comfortable. So you'll see in a moment, there's still a climbing branch in there. She still has a hide um, and that sort of thing. So some people will tell you that, uh, that the snakes always have a pre-birth shed. Again, just going by my experience, that's not the case. Um, I believe that some do. I also believe there may just be some coincidence in it, but what I'm telling you is none of mine have ever had a shed within a five day window of them giving birth, okay? So I'm not saying it's not true when you hear it or read it. Um, my experience is that there's no correlation there, okay? Now they may shed, they may have coincidentally been on target to shed, you know, two weeks before they gave birth. I've seen that happen. Uh, once or twice, but for the most part, I don't see any correlation. Okay, another sign is, remember we talked about the fact that um, their feeding response will increase when they become gravid, and it will be pretty significant, at least that's what I've seen. They really want to eat. They've got a bunch of ba babies to feed in addition to themselves, so they eat, eat, eat. Now this girl, for example, I've been feeding her, um, she's capable of eating full-size large adult mice. This is a about a 36, 38 inch plains garter snake. So she can put down full, um, full size mice, but that's not what I do. I give her smaller mice that are just easier for her to swallow and I feed them two at a time. And I've been feeding her every two days if she looks or acts like she's hungry. So all I need to do is thaw a couple out, go near that enclosure and she's gonna tell me, yes, I'm hungry, feed me. So I've been doing that every other day for about the last, I don't know, two or three weeks, something like that. Up until then, I was just feeding her on a regular schedule, which is about every five days, something like that. Okay, another thing uh, is the mass of weight on a female when they ovulate is, I would say midsection to maybe towards the tail section, okay? Now, most people will describe it as the, the last third of the body, and I'll get to that. So what I've seen is they put on weight in their midsection, okay, when they ovulate. If they become gravid, again, it's largely towards the, you know, the, the middle, but a little bit back from the middle. And I know that's, I'm being a little bit vague, but it's, it's not exactly the last third of the body until they get really close to dropping the babies. And just like you hear in humans, right, the baby drop, that's what happens. That mass of weight shifts to the back third of the body, and now you know she's close. She's probably gonna go into labor soon when you see, you don't physically see it move, but when you notice that the mass is back further, she's getting really close. All right, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that the mass from the babies is basically being carried in this area that's circled in red, in that as she approaches labor, this mass will shift towards the tail. That's what I'm trying to illustrate here with the arrow. This mass will again move back towards the cloaca and that will be an indication that she's getting pretty close. Another thing that will happen is they, I've seen them stop eating um, about a week before, uh, before they have babies. Now that, this again, it's not exact science guys, I've had uh, my other radix that had a litter earlier this year in March, she ate the day before she had her babies. So this isn't exact science, guys. Everything I'm sharing with you is directional. Um, don't, don't think of it as literal. It, it goes exactly in this order. It has to, you know, it's always 75 days. It's not like that. It's 60 to 90 days. It's, um, 
you know, all directional kind of information. So typically they will stop eating a week or so before they give birth, sometimes more, sometimes less, sometimes not at all, right? But that's a sign. If they stop eating, don't panic. That probably means that she's close. And think about it. She's full of babies. And just like uh, a woman, you get uncomfortable, right? The snake's uncomfortable. The last thing they want to do is jam more food down, down their throat and feel even more comfortable when they're getting that close to having babies, okay? So it all makes perfect sense. The final sign that I've seen, oh, well, two more things. One is I see them thermoregulating more, okay? And what I mean by that is they just move from their heat source and away more often than they do normally. Okay, so normally, you know, they'll they'll move to the heat source after they eat to digest their food, whether that be a basking area or belly heat. But one way or another, generally speaking, they're going to go to the heat source um, after they eat. And generally speaking, they, they'll probably leave that heat source much of the time. When they're gravid, what I've noticed is they're, they're constantly changing the, uh, their position to thermoregulate. Um, this girl here will go under her hide for a little while and 20 minutes later she'll be on top of the hide 20 minutes later she'll be at the other end of the tank she's constantly moving and thermoregulating to keep her body temperature at the right temperature for those babies okay so that's another sign and then the final sign that tells you she's getting really close is what many call surfing and this is look she's uncomfortable okay and and she she wants these babies out of her okay so they move around a lot. That's usually one of the final signs as they're getting close. The babies will drop, right? They've stopped eating probably. Then they start surfing. They're just moving around that tank a lot. Um, one of the things that triggers the birth, actually, is the babies have now developed enough that they're moving around inside of her a lot, just like a woman, guys, okay? So, the, you know, women can feel the baby moving around a lot, especially later in the development, later in, in the... Uh, in the cycle, same thing with, with the snake. She feels the baby's moving. She knows it's getting closer. She's getting anxious to, to get these babies out, right? And she's gonna be moving around a lot. So let me show you a couple things in the enclosure. All right, guys, so this is my girl. Now, right now, I can't tell whether she's just hungry or whether she's starting to surf, okay? So I'll figure that out. Um, she's due to eat today. So I will figure that out by bringing food and showing it to her and she'll tell me whether she's hungry or not but see she's she's restless right she's moving around a lot here's another sign you can see here all of the substrate is moved that's a good sign that she's been surfing right so you see she's moving around a lot this is not how she spends her day typically most of the time she spends her day down here this is where her heat source is and she again thermoregulates by going under it and on top of it of that hide i should say okay so I'm keeping a really close eye on her. Another thing I do is you notice that I've got blue tape on this enclosure. And the reason for that is there's little, without this blue tape, there's little tiny gaps here, okay? And normally for her, that's no problem. She can't get through that, of course. But when you're talking about little tiny babies, they can get through little tiny spots. So again, because she's been acting this way for a couple of days, I think she's getting close. She is on the early end of the scale, again, only at about 62 days right now, but she could drop baby soon, so I have this tape closing up these gaps just in case. Again, you can see there's very little in the enclosure itself. She, she's got a little bit of enrichment in that climbing branch. She's got her hide that she loves in a bowl, okay, which, by the way, has a piece of substrate in it. So. All right, so hopefully that information was helpful. Again, uh, it's, I'm not professing that my way is the only way. I'm not professing that everything I've presented is uh, complete fact. Again, because things can vary. Some people are gonna say, mine always shed before five days before they give birth. Okay, I'm not arguing that. What I'm saying is mine have not, <laughs> okay? Um, one of the difficulties in posting any of this kind of information on social is that you get these people that just want to profess that they know more than everybody else. I concede. There's lots of people that know more than me. That's okay. Share your opinions. Share your experiences. That's how we all learn. 
please don't give me a rough time about I'm wrong and I'm hurting the industry by trying to help educate other people. It's honestly, it takes the wind out of my sails and there's been too much of that lately. So thanks for not doing that. Okay, everybody else that's been supportive, thank you. I'll continue to do my best to share what I'm learning in hopes that it might help you. All right, peace out, everybody.